Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. And I'm back from my summer vacation where we went to Europe and I got to see some very good friends, spend time with uh, important people that I care about very deeply and visit a bunch of museums and bookshops. So I'll do a haul video later, but wanted to kind of get back into the swing of things with a week of reading. So this is obviously more than a week of reading because it's been a while since I've seen you. So I'm just going to jump in with the most recent things that I have read. Now, the very first thing that I completed has given me so much joy because it is a short story collection. It took me a very, very long time to get through. And yes, I'm new to short stories and all that, but this was also a collection that I just wanted to savor and I wanted to enjoy. And so I refused to push myself. And so I didn't read like one or two a day. I just returned to it when, um, when I had time to really enjoy it. And this is A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. My God, this is a UK cover, which I think is so much better than the American cover that's out there. And so I found this at a Oxfam store in Bloomsbury and it was four pounds and it was pristine. So I grabbed it immediately. And I'm so glad I did. What Lucia Berlin has been able to do with this collection is to show a swath of life of the American West slash Southwest into Mexico. So think um, Bay Area, not San Francisco, but specifically Oakland and Berkeley, uh, then uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, Mexico City specifically. And through really strong character studies, give us snippets of life of working class, of misfits, of uh, underdogs, of... Um, alcoholics, of people kind of down on their luck, but working through it. There's a lot of humanity and a lot of heart in this, in these collections. And the, they just stay with you. They, they, uh, her ability to immediately drop you into a scene and give you a slice of life that you probably would never have any kind of visibility into has was amazing, absolutely amazing. I found that her writing, she was able to be very tender with these characters. Nothing in here is that kind of um, absurdist, surreal, shocking, you know, kind of leaves you with a cliffhanger and then you scratch your head and say, what just happened? Instead, it's more of these rich character studies. And what I found is as I got into the later part of, of, this, of this collection is there are some reappearing characters, specifically uh, one woman who is, has left the United States to go to Mexico City to be with her and basically care for and tend to her dying sister, her sister dying of cancer. And she's an alcoholic and she's trying to hold it together but it's these moments of tenderness with her sister. And, you know, her alcoholism isn't the first and foremost thing. It's more the relationship between these two people. Um, it's, not, it's not overly wrought as, um, you know, redemptive that she's doing this amazing thing by being with her sister. It's just more, you know, what is their relationship? How are they, they what are they, how are they spending their time? Uh, I just, I loved this. I absolutely loved it. I think if I had found this book many, many years earlier, I would have been um, sold on short stories that much sooner. So I'm delighted that I finally, finally got to this. Then I did this one in digital format. This is Love and Mist by Susie Boyd. This was recommended to me by somebody that I went to Oxford with, Antoinette. And man, she... She just, this is a full throttle, full barrel recommendation that she gave me. And, and it was, she knocked it out of the park. This is a very complex mother-daughter relationship. We have Ruth, who is the mother, Eleanor, who's the daughter, and then Lily, who is 
in essence, the granddaughter. Near the beginning, we see Ruth, we see her in her life, and she you know, has this regular job. She's a middle-aged woman alone, and she has a daughter that she's caring for that we know about. And she's with a bunch of other women, uh, a bunch of friends that she's known for a long time. She seems to be a little reserved, a little awkward maybe, a little shy. And it's at this event, at this kind of luncheon with other women, that uh, an awkward conversation happens. And a woman says to Ruth in front of everyone that they saw Eleanor and a bunch of people out near a train station or something and that she looked like she was doing okay, and but she looked a little lost, but she looked healthy. Um, and then the woman said, I hope it's okay, but I gave her some money and I gave her a kiss on the head because I didn't know what else to do. And then you realize, oh, um, her daughter's homeless. And probably deals with either mental issues and or substance abuse, Something something's going on there. And it, it kind of sets Ruth off and she doesn't know how to react. You could tell that she's a little embarrassed. She's um, She feels awkward uh, at this revelation in front of everyone, doesn't really know what to do or say. So then we start to delve a little bit into, into what's happened and we don't get a lot from, nothing from Eleanor's position, but we get this span of, of this relationship of, of what happened between Eleanor and Ruth. The picture that's been painted of Ruth that we start to form as we're reading the book slowly starts to ravel a little bit as we see her grasping and desperation and um, codependence and and urgency of making sure that Eleanor is okay uh, and how that manifests in um, in the relationship and how she acts when she does get a chance to see and she does get a chance to be a part of Eleanor's life because Eleanor keeps her at a at a pretty strong distance. Uh, and then we also see Ruth do something that you can, s it's pretty unconscionable, but at the same time, you understand why she did it and what she, and what she did. But it was manipulative. It was a little underhanded. Uh, and it definitely, definitely makes you think of Ruth in a different way. Uh, this is... Also, this is just such a, an amazing story. The way it was crafted was so well told. The, the writing is exquisite. Um, this is very painful. It's about second chances. It's about um, um, broken relationships, broken family structures, and codependence. Uh, I, I thought it was a painful, but oh my God, such a brilliant story. I can't believe more people haven't been talking about this. Uh, I... I absolutely loved it. I thought it was exquisite and it broke my heart a little bit, I have to say. Uh, it was really, it was really, really good. So thank you, Antoinette, for the fantastic, fantastic uh, suggestion. Then I, speaking of heartbreak, this was another one. This was like back to back. So I, I, I definitely got my, my emotions stirred by these, by these last two books. The, the next one is Mayflies. And this is my first by Andrew O'Hagan. I have never read Andrew O'Hagan, but I've seen Mayflies everywhere. And it always looked like, you know, a fun book to read, but I really had no idea what it was about. Uh, this is a, set in 1986, and the, we have a small Scottish town, a uh, very small town, and we've got these group of young boys, specifically Tully and James. And they are best friends. And they live in this kind of working class environment. And they're both really smart. They're both literate. Uh, they, they, one wants to be a writer. James wants to be a writer. And they're just adventurous young men who just want to go out there and take on the world. And their options are very limited in this, in this town. Uh, as a kind of 
hurrah, uh, right after they, they're finishing up school, they decide to go down for a road trip down to Manchester uh, because there's going to be this huge concert that I think it's 10 years after the very famous uh, concert where the Sex Pistols uh, played for the very first time. And so it's this huge concert. I think it's either at the Hacienda or there's other things at the Hacienda happening. And they're, so there's all of these band references, you know, like the Smiths and, and um, New Order and Public Image Limited and all of these bands of this era were all being, it was all kind of referenced as we're, as we're reading this. And so they get this little posse together and they, they barely have any money. So they're just off. You know, this it, this is a, a ride or die kind of last hurrah. And they all go down there and one of them loses their ticket. And uh, all these other shenanigans happen. It's kind of rowdy. It reminded me of when I was young and I would go to D.C. or go to New York or go to Philly for a show and just hopping in a car and just driving and barely having enough for gas and just We'll figure it out, just knowing that it's going to be a great weekend with your friends. Uh, so we have this part of the timeline, and you really see the dynamic and the magic that Tully really brings to the relationship. He's kind of one of those people that everyone seems to gravitate toward. And he has this exuberance for life. He has this ability to make everything seem more magical, more exciting, better. Then we go 30 years into the future and we have Tully giving a call to James and he needs to ask him for a favor. And this favor is so important and so transformative. It's an ethical dilemma. It's, it really changes everyone's life uh, significantly and shows the, the bonds of this friendship in ways that were just so tender, so beautiful, so heartbreaking. Uh, it became an emotional journey, a deep, deep, deep emotional journey in, uh, in these two characters. And you can see where they, where they started and where they were uh, later on in life and the connections that, that held them together. I thought it was so beautiful. Also found myself sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> at this one. I'm not, a, I'm not really a, generally a crier for books, but these two really did me in. So I, I loved it. And it makes me want, I, I, I almost picked up Caledonian Road twice um, when I was in London, but it's so thick and I didn't have a lot of space in my luggage. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off because I know I can get it here in the States. Uh, but I would love to know if you've read it and what your, your thoughts are, or if he has any other books that you think I should read. Then next up, in preparation, uh, you know, I think I've talked before about how much I love the idea of anticipatory joy. And so as I lead into a vacation or lead into a holiday, I like to do reading that is kind of set in or about the area that I'm going to go to. And I found this and I thought it looked really lovely. This is Midnight Blue. This is by Simone van der Vloot. Vloot and it's by translated by Jenny Watson really pretty cover there. And this is uh, a historical book set in 1654. And we're following Katrine. And Katrine is a very interesting character. She has been newly widowed and she's still very young. She was in a, a marriage that she thought was going to be one thing, um, didn't spend enough time getting to know her husband, and he ended up being a complete brute and very difficult man to live with uh, and a complete drunkard. So when he dies, at, which is like at the opening, we already know that she's a widow, uh, she wastes no time in selling everything and getting out of, the, getting out of that small town that she grew up in. She has been doing painting. So she would paint on furniture and sell them. And she became known as someone who was a decorative painter, a uh, kind of craftswoman. And she would love to paint. She would love to do more of that. But at this stage, she just needs to get out of that, out of that area. She doesn't have a good relationship with her brother-in-law, her husband's uh, brother. And 
has so many bad memories and just longs for a different life. So she goes to the first bigger sized town uh, nearby and she looks for work and she doesn't really find anything. She goes into a tavern for some food and she meets a man and they start talking. Uh, she, she's introduced to this man and he says, well, my brother is in Amsterdam is looking for a housekeeper. You look like you're very strong and capable. I'll give you a note of introduction and you can you can take it to him if you're going to Amsterdam. And so she jumps on that opportunity. She also thinks he's quite handsome. So there's a little tension be w w between her and this man. And she ends up going uh, to Amsterdam and she presents herself with the, with the letter. And this man is incredibly wealthy, more wealthy than she really knew from conversations with the brother. And he has a wife who dreams of being a painter and so she's trying and trying and trying, and she's not really very good, <laughs> but she doesn't really know it. And the husband doesn't know enough about art to really help her. While she is the housekeeper there, uh, she makes mention of, well, maybe some classes would be good. Maybe she could get a tutor or teacher. And this is something that the her boss thinks is a good idea. So the house owner and his wife and and Katrine all go to see Rembrandt. Yes, that Rembrandt. And he says, oh yeah, I have an apprentice who, you know, I will let you use his services and he can come and teach your wife. And while they're there, they're, they, they talk about buying a painting. So she's completely enamored. She's completely overwhelmed by Rembrandt's home and all of the art there and is, is, is you know, thrilled. So, so because it's a man who's coming and the, the husband's often out traveling, she's there with, during, during the sessions so that, so that they're not alone together, this, the strange man and the wife. And as she's there, she's picking up little tips and tricks and, and things like that. And it becomes something that, so she's getting an apprenticeship um, and she knows so much more and is so much clearer about what needs, what should be done with these paintings. So things are going very, very well. She's a bit confused when the brother comes because there's still this spark, but she also knows that he's kind of a bad boy. He's kind of like this love him and leave him kind of uh, raconteur. You know, he's a, he loves to travel and he's kind of an adventurer. And so she's heard to be wary of him. And, and she also sees how other people relate to him. And she's like, oh, okay, he's a player. So she keeps a, at a distance from him. One day when she's at market, uh, her, one of her servants that she paid off uh, at, when she sold everything and left came looking for her. And he has told her that he knows a secret about her that he will tell unless she gives him half of her of her inheritance of what the money she got from selling everything she's freaked out and she knows that it's this guy could make trouble for her and so she goes ahead and she pays him but immediately after paying him she realizes he's going to be back because he's bad with money he's he already can sniff that she she's good with money and is going to be able to do well for herself and she realizes she can't stay so this brings her to have to resign. And it's upon the resignation that the that this brother says, you know what, I, I know that my brother who lives in Delft, my other brother, so there's three brothers, uh, is in need of support of a house because his wife just died. He probably needs help. So I'll give you a letter of, of introduction and you can go there. So she goes to Delft. And that's where, you know, this wonderful thing happens where everything that I read in Thunderclap, that's by Laura Cumming. It was, uh, the full title is Thunderclap, A Memoir of Art and Life and Sudden Death. And that was part of the Women's Prize nonfiction shortlist. Uh, so, so what I read there is, appears as uh, scenes in this book, which was so, so, so wonderful. I'll leave it there for now. Just know that this is packed full of interesting things that have happened in the Netherlands history, specifically in relationship to art and the Dutch masters, uh, as well as 
the craftsmen and, and the Dutch uh, ceramics and all of that good stuff. Uh, I thought this was really a fun read and it just made me so excited to go to, to Amsterdam and it even made me very excited when I went to uh, do a tour of Rembrandt's home and got to see all of the all of the things there that some of it was was mentioned in here. So it was if you like historical fiction, this was really fun. So that's what I have read. Let me show you what I'm currently reading. So I just finished this, but I'm waiting for Leo to check in. This is the next in our installment of the Rougon Macau series by Emile Zola. This is translated by Helen Constantine, and this was Nana. Uh, na uh, you know, very famous, famous uh, of the of the twenty part series. Uh, I will talk more about this next week, but just know that Zola is a master. Period. Period. I'm also listening to the audiobook of More Days at the Morisaki Bookshop. This is the second of, of that series. It's just a soft, gentle, quiet look at a family that runs a bookshop, uh, a, an uncle, his wife, and the niece, and uh, just beautiful, quiet stories of the community, of books, of of love of literature and the relationships between between them. Uh, and this is by Satoshi Yagasawa, and then it's translated by Eric Ozawa. Uh, it's so far really, really delightful, really lovely, nice, uh, soothing palate cleanser. Then I'm continuing on with my Elizabeth Bowen um, author spotlight, and we've moved on to her short stories. And so we're on the second of these short stories. So we're about halfway through the book. Uh, these are collected short stories. Uh, she did so many, but this is a smattering of them with an introduction from Tessa Hadley. And this is proving to be very interesting. She's, um, she's a very layered writer and she has some things that you can always expect. Um, atmosphere, something about a home, homes and um, Homes play a very important part in her writing uh, and uh, a lot of tension, uh, a lot of sexual tension that is ambiguous and a lot of trios um, and quartets. So uh, this has been fun to read through these and share reflections with everyone. And then I'm also making my way through this. And this is something that I got before going to New York, where which I did in April, May. This is The Long-Winded Lady by Maeve Brennan. And Maeve used to be a writer for The New Yorker. Yeah, The New Yorker between 1954 and 1981. And so these are collections of her essays. And they're just, the voice is so New York. <laughs> it's so quintessentially New York. And so these are really fun to dip in and out of. But that is everything. So I would love to know, have you read any of these and what were your thoughts? And if you know anything similar that you think that I should read, please let me know. Hope you had a great week of reading and I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, bye.